Arno Preminger is a distinguished uh, movie director. He's, um, I never know what he does between jobs. He happens to be in New York uh, between engagements, and when he, he's always in demand on talk shows. Um, he uh, is probably, uh, I, I don't know what he, where he goes to New York, where he eats, what he does here. I've often wondered, what does Otto Preminger do when he isn't actually directing a movie? Um, he samples sandwiches in well-known restaurants or something. I don't know. I'll find out what it is. But he is between engagements, and here is the lovable Otto Bubbles Preminger. <laughs> I'm glad to see you again. Where are you? And, uh, I want you to know that I live in New York. I vote in New York. No kidding. My main office is in New York. My house is in New York. My children go to school in New York. I'm a New Yorker. Well, but what are you what doing I do. here? I, the thing is, I... At the moment, I'm rehearsing for my next film here. Uh, On Sunday, I'm leaving here to make my next film in and around Boston. Actually. That's well, I'll tell you what it is. A smattering of applause for Boston there. Uh, I didn't wonder what you did in New York, but I had an idea for a joke, and I couldn't get it formed in my head. Does that ever happen to you? And um, I never have an idea for a joke. You know? <laughs> Somebody told me once that when... What is the joke? I, I never could get it. It was something to do with what you do between jobs, and I never worked it I'm out. I'm rehearsing at the moment. Oh, yes. And when I'm not uh, actually shooting or rehearsing, I work on a script. Actually shooting with a camera. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, I clear that up because you have a reputation for being tough. And I know that every time I've seen you... never for shooting. No, Sometimes no. for shouting, but not... Shouting. Yeah. <laughs> that must have been the joke. <laughs> Somehow I doubt it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Your modesty speaks for you. We know, I, wish I must tell you that I have watched your shows and they are wonderful. You have sat I'm in front a of a set and watched yes, me in, yes. in the screen? Yes. Gee, you've stuck with me. You've been on it several times with me, and... Um, I'd love to be on with you. And you gave Jean Seberg a second chance after she did uh, that one movie that was such a bomb. You've stuck with all the losers, Mr. Brennan. <laughs> no, you mean... It doesn't apply to you. I don't think no, you're, I, uh, you're a winner. I hope. A great winner. Hope you're right about that. Say, I saw Stalag 17 again. You know, they show it occasionally on The Late Show, in which you play that um, a German... or a Nazi. Actually, yeah. there is a difference. And... Um, they hardly. <laughs> Slight. <laughs> we, huh. we forward the mail with the eagles on it to you. And, and, um, <laughs> I was like, uh, oh, I heard that on, on the set of that movie, it was hard for you to get out of character because it's a, a very strong character that you were playing, and there were jokes that off camera as well as on you. You were the yes. character. Is that just a slander? One of the oldest they... joke Billy Wilder said, you know, I must be nice to you because I still have family in, in Germany. <laughs> that is, Billy Wilder said that, though, originally. No. He, may have, he may have started that. He said it originally. I heard something that intrigues me about you. I read it. Uh, I was looking back over all the things you've done. Uh, this may be wrong, by the way, because it's one of those bios that I are frequently you, yes. uh, not factual, you know. But uh, you directed John Barrymore in, in My Dear Children? Yes, on the stage. That's amazing. That's the play right at the end of his career. where his he last was play. Really, yes. in and the it last... it was a wonderful period. experience, not because the play was particularly good, but he was one of the brightest and wisest men about the theater. He knew mm. more about acting and about the theater than most people that I've ever met, and I've worked with many great actors. He was yeah. a wonderful man. He was just tired, you know. He was... At the time I worked with him, I remember I came once to St. Louis to inspect the show. It was on the road. And he, uh, the show was over. Instead of 11, he had lived until 1 in the morning. It was awful. You know, he just was tired. He sat down. He didn't get up. So after the show, we were in the restaurant. And he said, well, Professor, how did you like it? And I said, terrible. You know, it's just beneath human dignity. And everybody thought it would be a fight was very quiet and he said tomorrow come tomorrow and I went the next day and he did it perfectly like we rehearsed it every position every line in you everything mm. so I went to his dressing and said Jack why don't you do this every night like this he said yeah. bored dear boy bored yeah. See, he was just bored he couldn't it was too bright to do the whole silly play every night the same way what profession should he have gone in if he was bored with acting 
you know, I should have been an actor, but you see the repetition. Oh, of a play. See, this is why many actors, yeah. in spite of the fact that the contact with the uh, audience is gratifying, prefer working in films or in television, mm -hmm. because you don't have to do it so often. If you go on doing the same thing every night, like if you did the same show every night, it'd be terrible. Yeah. This way, because you don't know what your guests are going to say, mm -hmm. there's suspense in the air. Huh? Right. What am I going to say? I hate that thing. <laughs> <laughs> you also worked with, uh, these are sort of tragic figures, Barrymore and Marilyn Monroe, but did, did you make a film with yeah. Marilyn Monroe? Or? I made a film called River of No Return. Oh, yeah. But the greatest it. actress I ever worked with was Laurette Taylor. I did a play with her called uh, mm -hmm. Outward Bound. And it was a terrific experience. Somebody should do a study of alcoholism in the theater. I believe she was also, was she not Yeah, but she was completely cured when I did this play with her. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we were both invited. The play was invited to play in Washington for Roosevelt's birthday. And we were invited to the White House. And this was a great experience, so great for her that she was tongue-tied. She had prepared maybe 20 questions to ask him. And we sat yeah. at the same table next to the president. And she couldn't open her mouth. She was so excited. And he was a wonderful man, really a wonderful experience to meet him. Have you seen the new book on Marilyn Monroe? Uh, I haven't read it yet. It's I, uh, as a matter of fact, it was sent to me, and mm -hmm. when I started to read, there were so many inaccuracies in it. They asked me for a, you know, for the, for the, for an advance uh, review blurb, or something. And yeah. I called him and I said, if I give you an advance blurb, you won't print it. And it's mm -hmm. very difficult, you know, with Marilyn Monroe. She was really a very nice poor girl who tried very hard and was very unhappy. And whatever you read, there's so much gossip and, and inaccuracy that it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Do you know Tiny Tim? I met him several times and I met him just now outside. Yeah. And he uh, is wearing all the hair that I lost. <laughs> I have a feeling. When he comes out here, he'll be sitting next to you, or you'll be sitting next to him. It'll look like some weird sort of before and after, won't it? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, I bought today for Liza Minnelli, who plays the, the lead in my film uh, that mm. we are rehearsing now, Tell Me That You Love Me, Juni Moon, a wig for one scene, yeah. and uh, it looks exactly like Tiny Tim's hair. Gee, I wonder if it is. <laughs> we, we have to oh, pause. No. We'll find out in a moment. We'll be back. Can you stay? Uh, Charles Dickens, as you probably know, created the original Tiny Tim, and uh, only God could create the second one. Uh, we have the latter here tonight. Will you welcome Tiny Tim? Thanks, Mr. Kevin. It's a pleasure yeah. being on your show. Yes, I'm sorry I didn't get to meet you during rehearsal. There was a terrific mob here watching you rehearse, and I couldn't get over here, and I oh. didn't get to say hello. Well, well, thanks for watching me rehearse. Can I... You're welcome. <laughs> Can I check a couple of rumors with you? There, there are several things that... Uh, one is that you give a trophy to a beautiful girl. Is this every year or whenever you feel like it, or how does that work? Yes, well, I've been very fortunate to meet so many beautiful young angels, and ever since... Angels? Now, uh, and ever since 1963, mm -hmm. I've been giving out trophies. I've given out 13 trophies since that year. Uh, sometimes it's more than one a year. Sometimes it could be two or three. Oh, I see uh, you. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, everything is in purity and with no strings attached. Uh, as everyone knows, uh, I, usually, I usually talk to them about their problems. We don't believe in any kissing or anything. No nothing, kissing? Uh, until marriage, so uh, I just want to get that straight. That, that everything is pure and platonic. A lot of people just left in the balcony. No, I, I, I realize that you're serious about that. Uh, yeah, and uh, not only that, Mr. Cavett, but I tell you honestly that it's such a thrill to sit there and to look at their beautiful faces, have a spiritual dream, and share the moment whether it's a second, whether it's an hour, or whether it's the luxury of two days. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really a thrill. Two days of sitting there looking? Uh, <laughs> well, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah. uh, I know uh, you have, um, I know you're a terrific baseball fan, one of the most uh, rabid baseball fans. And do, do you have 
As a kid, did you want to be a player, or have you ever played the game, or is it you just like to watch it? And uh... I've always had the uh, spirit to play the game, yeah. but apparently not the physical prowess. Yeah. And, and I can honestly tell you that um, I always feel, however, that even when I'm on stage, even if I'm walking down the street, or even if I'm talking to this beautiful young angel, I feel that I'm behind the plate, uh, either or behind the hockey nets, uh, you know, in a clutch position. Yeah, everything, I saw where you're a hockey fan. A clutch position. Yeah, everything yeah. in life really can relate to a baseball diamond or to a hockey net because it doesn't matter whether you're a clerk or whether you're uh, a messenger or uh, someone in the lights. The point is that there's always pressureful moments. There's always a three and two count. And how you fare, whether you freeze up or come through, is really related to the rules of baseball or the rules of hockey. Yes. I thought it was Thoreau who said that. <laughs> uh, you know, there are all kinds of rumors that uh, you, you really take all this off, uh, you know, and, and that you don't, that actually you're Alan Ludden in disguise or something. <laughs> I mean, you, you, must, you must hear this all the time. And yet, as I see you now, you're absolutely, literally real. And, uh, well, and well, I, I know that's no news to you, but... <laughs> Do people, do they jibe at you still or jeer at you sometimes and say, I get a haircut and all that? Well, sometimes that happens. But, you know, of course, the good laughing out of Christ, he knows that that's all that matters. But talking about baseball, what a mm. thrill it is. <laughs> uh, really, well, honestly, I, I just have to mention yeah. you, that Mr. Maury Wills came back to the Dodgers with Mr. Manny Mota in the greatest mm. trade that ever happened since the Cox uh, Breach Road deal in the 40s. And yeah. I can tell you right now that the seventh straight was uh, is, is only the beginning. Mm -hmm. I really believe they're going all the way this year. And they might, uh, thank you. And they might meet the Mets in the, yeah. in the uh, three out of five thing. When you're on stage, when you talked about a clutch position, do you actually relate this to your work? I mean, suppose the audience, well, they all love you now, but in the days when you were coming up, um, if you were in bad trouble with an audience, uh, I suppose you've had that experience. Did you picture yourself as a, as a guy in a clutch well, or a squeeze always, player? One is always the most pressureful moments, uh, at least in this situation when I'm under pressure, is when really a real pretty girl is there who I know. And, oh. she, and she's in the audience. And that's really a real classical, real pressureful moment. Mm -hmm. uh, the point is, what are you going to do? Are you going to freeze up? The only thing that any artist can do in a situation like that is to sing good to himself and uh, let the chips fall where they may. Right. Do you feel that, Mr. Preminger? <laughs> I couldn't see much because it, his hair is like a curtain the sun. But I think he's right, you oh, know. As a matter you. of fact, if we two could play baseball together, you know, or against each other, just the two of us, it'd be fun. Yes. Oh. Shall we try? Oh, well, I tell you, I, I have a Ted Don't Williams stance. Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> you have a what? A Ted Williams stance. He has a Ted Williams stance. <laughs> well, I, I don't know whose stance I have. I'll use my own. <laughs> I also know that you admire the astronauts, or was it that you would like to be one and or go along to the moon? Well, Is it the moon you admire? Well, not really an astronaut, Mr. Cavill. I I've always been... <laughs> I want to see. <laughs> I'd slap his face if I were you. Thank you, Mr. Well, thank you. Do I don't hide my face. No, you can't. Why? D do the same to him sometimes. Oh, yes. uh, I have always been no. fascinated with outer space and the mysteries uh, of space as well as the underground world and the uh, strange mysteries of the Earth going back way, way, way before the 50s. And uh -huh. I can honestly tell you that now, it's not an astronaut that I'd want to be. I'd love to, you know, to go to the planet and stay there and, and, and roam... Uh, Thank you. I, I, I love to see. I love to see what's on the planets. I love to see. I, re, I really believe that there's life on every planet, with the exception of the sun, and that's a maybe, because uh, <laughs> I can't see. I can't see thousands and thousands of miles without anything living on it. And so, definitely, I would love to go up there and see what's there. Sure. You know, to live there. Do you have any kind of say Should unfulfilled? Should we leave now? He and I. No, no. Please stay. We have a few. Yeah. D d is there anything that you haven't? Any goal that you haven't fulfilled? I know you're very happy about your professional success. Yes, well, well, basically, uh, I love to sing message songs, the songs that were so predominant before 1925, which I've also done not only in parties, but in private cliches. You know, usually when I meet 
people in trouble, with girls or guys, mm -hmm. and, and they'll say, I said, don't run away from home, young woman. Stay with your mother, because you're always a baby to mother. Doing it in the spirits of these old-time singers like Byron G. Harlan in 192, Irving yeah. Kaufman, Arthur Fields. I wonder if I could do just one number here, which the audience has never seen before. Sure. I think we would probably have to do it in the next segment, okay. uh, as we call it. But uh, we have uh, just a minute here, and then we have to go to commercial or something. But we'll talk. We can do it later. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you. Um, uh, when I was talking about the, f when I was thinking about the future. Oh, we should do it now. Okay. L stay with us. We'll be back. Why not? Here we are. We're talking about your future. I know you're very happy when you perform. Do you plan to continue as a performer uh, 10, 20, 30 years from now? Or would you? Can you see yourself doing something else finally? Well, I don't know what the future will hold, Mr. Mm -hmm. Cabot, but uh, apparently as long as I can sing these message songs, whether it's, whether it's on 3rd Avenue or 5th Avenue, uh -huh. I'll be doing it. Yeah. Well, well, you know. It's amazing, your success. I remember we used to see each other in the village about six years ago when I was starting out doing an act, and I used to see you around. And, and um, suddenly now you have all this fame and everything, and I'm still grubbing around. <laughs> Well, I really feel, I don't feel any different than I did yeah. five years ago. Uh, in fact, uh, I even sang the airplane a couple of days ago. Did you? Yeah. I just took out the ukulele and I sang for the stewardesses. So uh, yeah. you, you just never know when a song comes along. Yeah. I, may I ask you for the telephone number of your singing teacher I want to take this? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I want to take this. Is, uh, this the best is... talents are untaught, Preminger. <laughs> Repeat this, please. I, I don't know what I said. You think that he, <laughs> you think he never took lessons? Oh, sure. Well, I don't know if he took lessons or not. Let's no, find I out when I get Ann Miller out here. You mean I should just start to sing? Oh, well, a good Lord bless me. A good Lord bless me. <laughs> Can't see Preminger warbling, can you? <laughs> I, I must introduce Ann Miller or we will get behind. Then we can all... I, I'll talk. Ann Miller, is you, you probably know her. Uh, she tapped her way to fame Some and fortune man. in a uh, number of movies never to be forgotten um, <laughs> well seldom to be forgotten some of them uh, tarnished angel melody ranch true to the army and my favorite reveille with beverly <laughs> a, she played beverly of course in this and uh, she did about 30 other of the fun-filled musicals of the uh, that kind and um, today she is uh, at the Winter Garden in New York Theater. They always used to refer to her as having gorgeous gams, you know, in the, in the press. And um, I understand that they really are, and they are on display at the Winter Garden in Maine, where critics are saying that she may possibly be the best Maine of them all. And it's a pleasure to welcome Ann Miller. Yeah. <laughs> pictures that you chose. To, that was so funny because usually it's Kiss Me Kate or well, I thought I'd Easter get some Parade, of that. but that was really fun. I thought I'd <laughs> camp it up a bit. You really did. I was hoping <laughs> to forget those. <laughs> Reveille with Beverly has got to be the best title I ever thought of for a movie, I think. Oh, it's so wild. And it was Frank Sinatra's first picture. And every time I see Frank, I always tease him and say, well, I really knew you when, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you certainly so. have done well for a kid with rickets. Uh, I read... <laughs> no. Well, I really did have them when I was is six that, years old. That's true, isn't it? I read that's that about you. And I, I took dancing. My mama gave me dancing when I was, you know, just a baby. As a kind of therapy for... Ballet, because mm -hmm. ballet will straighten legs on a child. You know, yeah. it, it, it's very good for you, mm -hmm. particularly when you're at that age. I wonder if you remember being in Believe It or Not once. Do you know what I'm referring to? A Believe It or Not item about... Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I know what you're referring to. Otto, you'll get a kick out what of this. What is Believe It or Not? Well, there was Believe it or Mr. Not? Ripley had a Believe It or oh, Not. Yes, you sure. remember he used to have, like, a drawing in the paper? And yeah. Ripley's Believe It or Not was all the things in the world that you just couldn't believe. You say, would you believe, you know? Right. And uh, they at RKO, one of the publicity gimmicks they did, but it really did, it really was for real. They put a speedometer on my ankle. Mm -hmm. And I had to ricky ticky ticky tick, tick all the taps, and I... Believe it or not, as he said, I danced 500 taps a minute. And that was quite a record. And he, they sort of figured that that was the world's fastest 
Tap. Record. Yeah. Right. So that's how that all came about. That's, you remember more, that? that's more taps than the FBI can do. Oh. <laughs> how about that? <laughs> we have to pause. We'll find out in a moment. We'll be back. Can you stay. You, uh, you're one of the many people these days who agree, who believes in astrology, and um, yes, I was just uh, hearing uh, Tim say that he uh, is it Tiny Tim or just oh, Tim? Tim. It's okay. Tiny. okay. <laughs> I didn't know whether to say Mr. Tiny Tim or Mr. Tiny or <laughs> no, but um, I Tiny. forgot what the question was. Well, I was like, you know what it is. Astrology. astrology. Oh, is it? Oh, astrology. Yes, my director said it's astrology. Mm -hmm. I'm Aries the Ram. What are you? I am Sagittarius. What are you, Tiny Tim? Ah, uh, whatever April is. April. Whatever April what, what is. April, April is fool. Twelve. No. <laughs> Who would have thought? April what? Tim? Twelve. April the twelfth. Meet another April the twelfth. Okay. Are you yeah. kidding? You know, I've been trying to look for my astro twin. What hour were you? <laughs> Do we look alive? <laughs> well, oh, what's wrong? Your astro twin? Well, you know, um... You know, now that you mention it... No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, you know, do you know what an astro twin is? Yes. Well, I don't maybe know. they. Well, I'll sh would you mind if I told the audience and, sure, and you? Sure. I mean, if you find it interesting, if it's dull, I'll shut up. Yeah. But the, the why thing is this is, up? Well, in, in astrology, if you can find the, a person that was born the same day and the same hour and the same year as you were, that would be your astro twin. And they uh. have had records of this, particularly in East Indian philosophy and so forth, where they have found this, that their lives have been very, very similar, almost uncanny, the things that have happened to them. Hmm. Also the same, the same year? <laughs> yes, the same year, the same hour of birth. The same day, the same hour, and the same year. Could there be more than one astro twin? Could, there could be several, couldn't there? Uh, probably, yeah. yes. Be thousands. Uh, but it would be interesting. It has to be where the planets are exactly at the same mm. time. And that's where you get into astrology. The planets have to be a certain place at the same time. Yeah. And that's your astro twin. Now, how are your planets at the moment? Are they favorable? Are they... Uh... Well, listen, you know, if you really are interested in this, I well, have I... a marvelous astrologer back in L.A. Her name is Edith Randall. She mm. predicted everything that would happen to me, particularly about my doing a stage show. Being in Maine, And even? she said that Saturn had been sitting on top of me for 20 years. <laughs> and... and and what she said, a nasty thing. And, when it, <laughs> and said that it has now left, and it's off of me, and now Jupiter is in my house. And you know... Your life is scandal-ridden. No, but it's, 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 absolutely, it's absolutely amazing, because I really did go into Maine down in Florida at the time she said, and you know, that this would happen at a certain, certain time of the year. And I did do Maine down in Florida, and it was through that show. I did so well down there that that's how I got... Maine on Broadway, and it's just been marvelous ever since. And that's just since Saturn got off your back. That's right, and it had been on, in my back, sitting on top of me for 20 years. So that's why I know that there must be something to it, because I have had a lot of troubles and heartaches and things. We, we have to oh, pause. No. We'll find out in a moment. We'll be back. Can you stay? That's great. Oh, we're back. We were talking about the fact that uh, uh, Miss Miller was saying she's never found a dance partner really is really tall, tall enough for her. Have. Fred Astaire is, is well, shorter Fred than you Astaire are? Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly were all shorter than I was, you know, so I always had to dance by myself, but now I have found my partner. <laughs> 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 and furthermore, he's born April the 12th, the same day I am. <laughs> so and that must mean something astrologically, don't you think? <laughs> welcome to... <laughs> welcome to Bride and Groom. <laughs> We bring people together and they find happiness. <laughs> That's really amazing. And Esther and Kelly are short. So I could well, dance with them. No, I found the fire. <laughs> Maybe we better. Well, I think I'm very tall. <laughs> Perhaps we better move on. Uh, Cleveland Amory is uh, a friend of ours who is here. He's, uh, as you know, a critic at large for Saturday Review magazine. And he's a television critic for TV Guide. And he has been a critic for all these years and managed to retain a number of friends. Will you welcome Cleveland Amory? Here you are. <laughs> Have you been witnessing our spectacular yeah, show, business, show business history? 1969. Here. 
So you've had an honor lately. I was clued in on. You were awarded uh, something. Uh, do we redress you as doctor now? Uh, well, it is. It. I, I got a, an honorary degree and delivered a commencement address at uh, New England College in Henniker, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And I liked it because it was basically for the work I've done in the animal field. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it, it's a funny thing to give a commencement address now, Dick, to uh, students. I mean, the first thing I noticed was that they, though they were gowned, they were unarmed, you know. And, <laughs> and I was in the ideal position because you mount this platform and the sun was at my back and in their eyes. So it's the <laughs> ideal military position. Speaker's dream. Eh? And then I uh, had a chance to tell them that I was afraid they would find life on the outside a little dull. Uh, I said that we only changed our presidents, for example, every four years, you know. <laughs> and, and, that used to <laughs> and then I said that I knew that they would, uh, you know, move into and uh, make the change into sit-in offices rather easily, I thought, but that uh, their grievances, I didn't think uh, they could be handled the way they were used to through their channels, you know, two, <laughs> four, and seven. But I, I thought that they, they would have to handle them through regular <laughs> channels. That's better than the speeches I've heard at affairs like that. Um, what's, your, what's the second honor you have now? Well, the two. second honor really is a very, a very exciting thing, out of way. I think that uh, I received a letter from Miss Jill Goldstein, the editor of es an editor of Esquire magazine, and she told me that I'd been picked out as a, a group of people of notable fields of endeavor and all. It was very flattering, who uh, w would feel, she felt, the, the way of Philip Roth and... Uh, and uh, Kenneth Tynan and uh, the young people of today feel about the new sexual frankness being liberating. Mm -hmm. And she said that they were going to take a picture of all these people. And she said the picture will, of course, be in the nude. But you didn't take this opportunity? Well, <laughs> I tell you, I don't what I figured. I figured that, uh, you know, at first I was shocked, I'll admit. I was brought up in a different school, you know, and. And uh, then I thought about it for a while, and I thought all the authors through the years, you know, that have been honored and prizes and awards mm -hmm. for the body of their work. Well, <laughs> yes, and? <laughs> well, here was little old me being honored for just my body, you know, but I, I, I frankly, you know, I'll admit, Dick, I went to the mirror, you know, and I, I looked, I brought my, uh, well, I stripped, and I brought my full critical faculties to bear. B-A-R-E. Yeah. Uh -huh. did, you, did you take the photograph? Well, I, first I looked which was my best side. What, you what know? issue? Uh, what, what issue uh, will it be in? Oh, it'll be in the Christmas issue. It'll be the birthday issue. That's sacrilegious. I, isn't it incredible? Sacrilegious. But you and know, all of these distinguished people, uh, or, or presumably until now distinguished people, are going to well, to I don't pose know whether they're going to do it or not. You know, I yeah. wrote them back. It's a funny thing about nowadays. I heard uh, Kenneth the other night on this program talking about it. And he said that nudity is something you do uh, uh, every time, like once, you know, like you go to a bullfight. Well, you can imagine how that appealed to me, but uh, right. we won't. Uh, but what uh, amazed me, I actually wrote them a serious letter, and they didn't really, uh, I mean, a semi-serious letter. I said that I, Miss Jill Goldstein mm -hmm. was just a name to me in their masthead, you know, mm -hmm. that I said with the formality of the magazine between us, she'd never come through as a real person. And I felt that if we were going to be liberated as authors, that the editors should be liberated too, you know? And we, we could all be liberated in one picture and the all together, as they used to say. <laughs> you turned the table. But you right? haven't met Miss Goldstein. No, I haven't, but I no, thought it would be a nice... I think change. you're a very courageous man. <laughs> how do you know? That they might accept. How do you know what she looks like? <laughs> Mr. Amory, can I make a suggestion? Yes. Why don't you just take them all down to see old Calcutta and be done with it? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Have you seen it? Yeah, no, I haven't seen it. I have seen it. Have what you did seen you think it? of yeah. it? What did you think of it? Well, I mean, it's so much nudity, but at the end of it, I was bored. You know, because That's nothing sad. left to my imagination. But some of it was very beautiful. Yeah, there is that danger that you're so There's exposed dancer, to nudity that you're immune to. There's a dancing couple uh, uh, who are wonderful. That, that girl is really beautiful. I wish they were the only nude people. but. They are ten, and they are always new. But you know so many things, Dick, now that are going on that are really so almost beyond the pale. You take, uh, they had a meeting out in California of the California Social, Statewide Social Sciences uh, Studies Committee, and they decided that only history professors wanted history in the curriculum anymore, and there wasn't going to be any more history teaching. Now, isn't that incredible for nowadays? to think that kids are going to grow up, you know? And I thought of it in one way. I thought, well, anyway, you know what? 
Santillana said that those who are ignorant of the past are condemned to repeat it. Well, at least these kids will go up, they won't even know they're repeating it, will they? But, um, well, I think it sounds sick. But did it really happen? It really happened. Why did you switch the subject from nudity to history? <laughs> I didn't even notice. It was that Adam just... and Eve that did it. <laughs> I don't know, really, but I think that uh, a lot of what's going on now is, uh, is uh, if I had a word for this, uh, for this uh, era, I'm afraid I would have to use the phrase, the age of exhibitionism. I guess it must be. Maybe, what, who knows what it will... Uh, I don't know whether it's it all precedes. bad or good, but you know mm. darn well that things are going on that really, if you took a look at from any kind of perspective, you wouldn't, I, I don't mean in the quite case of censorship or something like that, but it's just darn nonsense, you know. And did you decide for yourself on the front or back view? For I decided on, I decided on my left side, I thought it was more liberating. <laughs> the way I'm looking at you, this is my best side. Ah, you, look, getting. you look very handsome. Somehow I don't I'm expect you. I'm going to you. buy Esquire. You're, you're already getting an issue yeah. in reserve. I'm right? going to. Uh, you see, all I did was succeed in selling the magazine. Yeah, exactly what sword, I didn't want to do. You have sold the Christmas issue. People be, are practically standing in line. <laughs> I'll be quite startled if you end up appealing to my prurient interest. I must say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got one good news for you about television, Dick. That's it. One good news. Did you see that after something like six months, that the government bureau had finally decided that the 20 million television sets that are uh, accused of having excessive color television, excessive radiation, yeah. that what we're going to have now is brand new rules. And one of the things it said that you should never have your set fixed by anybody who wasn't a competent person. Well, the only trouble with that, you see, I've had my set four years now, and 43 people have been to fix it. And I know the guy they mean, the competent fella, but you see, the trouble is he's abroad, you know. And uh, you, you think of, and they also said the second thing, that you couldn't get within six to ten, you couldn't get nearer than six feet to your set. Yeah. So if anybody's listening to us nearer to six feet, that set isn't fixed by a competent person, I think they ought to just... You're in trouble. Back up a little bit. Yeah. And what happens then? Well, uh, that, that is, an, they said if a toddler was at loose in your house, that you should uh, turn your set off and unplug it. Now listen, if a toddler like that was loose in my house, I'd call the cops. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever been attacked by the people uh, that have been targets of your reviews? Do you run into them? I'm always fascinated with that with the critics. One or two of them have been wonderful. You know, uh, uh, the uh, Walter Brennan that plays uh, Will Sonnet, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't give such a terribly good review to Will Sonnet. And he said, if I ever came on the, on the set, he'd shoot me. First, no, wait a minute. First he'd punch me in the nose, and then he'd shoot, shoot. Oh. See, they're clapping. I knew. Another one, but uh, another really uh, a good one was uh, uh, Monty Hall cornered me out there after I'd reviewed Let's Make a Deal. I don't believe any of your listeners have ever seen Let's Make a Deal. Oh, you have seen it. I haven't. I, I suggested that, that uh, there were some improvements that could be made in that remarkable show. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Marty Hall cornered me out there, you know, and he went through the review deck, line by line, and he'd say, you know, something he could quote it by heart, and he, really? every single thing, and then he'd turn to a great group of people, and he'd say, it was wrong, wasn't it? And they'd all back him, you know. Every I expect he interpolated a lot of wit in this, though, movie. Well, and fi <laughs> finally he said at the end, Dick, he said, uh, he said, uh, I want you to know one thing, the week that your review came out, we had the highest ratings we ever had. Hmm. I thought that was kind of sweet. That's pretty good. It's still a rotten show. <laughs> well, we have to pause it. We'll find out in a moment. We'll be back. Can you stay? Tiny, do you watch TV a lot? Do you sit in front of the set? And... Not very much, Mr. Cabot. Uh, no. Just when the Dodgers play or the Leafs play in hockey. <laughs> you don't have to call me Mr. Cabot. I, I mean, saw if you I can call you Tiny, you can call me normal-sized Cabot. And... <laughs> I saw last night one of the most charming shows on television. What's it? And it was Bill Cosby showing films of young uh, people. Oh, I heard that was good. Yeah, I didn't see yeah. it. Really Did you see it? Yes. It was really, and he's so charming with children. I hope they rerun that. But I, I think we should pay some credit on this network to, to this show right here. I mean, they have had the. They, yes, I do. They, they have had the courage. 
to, to, to make comment in prime time. Now, the whole Smothers thing was really a fight between entertainment and news departments. And the entertainment departments, the news department does not want them to have the right to make comment. And I think the very fact that you're on at 10 o'clock in the evening mm -hmm. and an entertainment hour, and yet we can all comment on any subject we want, has made it a very exciting thing, and I think ABC deserves a lot of praise. Can you say it in 20 seconds? Yeah. Okay, we only have 20 seconds left. Go. May I invite you to my next film and to give your review right there, very much like this, yes. to the opening of my next film, and you'll speak out well, like would, this? I would like to. Thank How you. About that? It's called Tell Me That You Love Me, Juni Moon. Oh. I thought you'd forget the title. Uh, Liza Minnelli. Stay yes. as lovely as you are, will you? And you too, Anne. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Tiny Tim. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Preminger, Cleveland Amory. Uh, Friday's guests will be William Buckley, and if that isn't enough, Leslie Caron, and if that isn't enough, Sam and Dave, and if that isn't enough, Tony Randall, and uh, if that isn't enough, don't watch, because that's all we have. Uh, William Buckley, Jr. We'll be back. This is Fred Foy speaking. Good night.